All right, today I have for you an interesting video. This is the somewhat major-ish update tier list. I have a couple of minor ones in here, and there's going to be somewhat of the debate about what's major or what have you. But I'd say that these six are the most impactful. Yes, I have just reworked a biome tier list into this, and I'll tell you what each one of these is going to be and my criteria for ranking them. So, this plains one is going to be hearth and home. This swamp was going to be root. This mountain one here, of course, frost caves. Mistlands is mistlands. Meadows is Hildur's quest. And this black forest one is different because this is going to be the Jace Mars uh, sorting quality of life update. Mm. Just a little small thing, but really nice. We have here the tiers, special, all around amazing, bit lacking, just see, I didn't think of anything clever there, and then what's going on. Spoiler alert, nothing's going to be in what's going on. All the updates have been relatively uh, net positive, but I want to discuss how there is more to be said other than just, oh my god, the biomes are taking so long, and then people come out and say, let them cook. Guys, they're going to take a long time, but that means that the updates are going to be absolutely perfect with no flaws ever. And that's just uh, not constructive on either side. So, there are going to be things that need to be said. This isn't a perfect dev team by all means. And there are things that, while well, they are in process of developing the game, that they can potentially learn. And have learned. They have indeed responded to some things that the community has asked for. So, you know. You know, that's uh, it's pretty good. But yeah, this uh, this talk, especially in regards to Ashlands, is why I'm interested in this. Uh, a lot of the people who have said, let them cook, let them cook, uh, have really not been mentioning all of the weird oddities that happened in the Mistlands update. And that's kind of still lacking from that update in the bio. And a lot of people who do critique the Mistlands don't seem to have proper understanding of what's going on. There's so just some kind of one-liners that people throw in, and uh, as for the rest of the criteria, I really want to look at how much good is the quality of the stuff that the update brought compared to some of the easy layups missed. Like, okay, well, th these things were in the teasers. Uh, these things have some obvious implications in-game. Some really easy layups that uh, any sort of simple gamers over the years would have really strived to include it in the development process. And yet they're not there. That's going to be points against. That's going to mean a lower ranking in the tier list. Let's go into it proper. Let's start with Hearth and Home. Hearth and Home was all around amazing. I loved Hearth and Home. The way that they changed the uh, food system was really weird at first, and then within like two days, they made it a lot better. And I don't think anybody cared that they made it a little bit better uh, after it was made much, much, much worse. I'm talking like food gave at first uh, less of the main stat and much less of the secondary stat that it has in those first few days so it wasn't you know it wasn't that good at first and then they fixed it around and i actually really like it a lot because there was some food that was just ridiculous like lox meat pie that was uh 80 health 80 stam and it was absurd everybody was running lox meat pie and wonderfully so uh Problem is with the food, they nerfed fish wraps into oblivion, and it's still kind of in oblivion today. So fish wraps used to be the best food in the game. It used to be 25 health and 95 stamina, which it's just ridiculous amounts. And of course, stam is just absolutely amazing, and it was amazing back then. Being able to uh, attack, dodge, walk, mine, do anything took stam, uh, not walk, sprint. So, <laughs> being able to have a lot of stamp, that's important. And being able to just have your one health food be a lox meat pie, which also gave you the same amount 
in stamina is ridiculous. You still had stuff uh, that was good in terms of strategy to dominate enemies that I didn't even know about at the time. Strategies that I figured out post Mistlands that are applicable all the way back in vanilla Valheim, never mind Arkham Home. So when your HP gets nerfed to such a degree, uh, people moaning is really just really just lacking in skill, lacking in knowledge. Uh, you know, your Huntsman bow still had 4 meter aggro radius instead of 8 like other bows at early access launch. Sledges still had spherical hitboxes, and ooze bombs uh, had the AoE as well, which is great versus certain uh, uh, tough areas dungeons. Ooze bombs not as good at the moment because of the lack of dungeons, but still, sledges, I didn't know about sledges until after Hearth and Home. Having that spherical hitbox, good for cheese, good for all sorts of uh, destructible or indestructible barriers or rocks. Uh, I didn't know about that. I didn't know about Huntsman Bow until uh, the January after Hearth and Home. So all of these things combined with uh, the way that staggering works, uh, the, the way that staggering was changed in Hearth and Home, so that, okay, now you have to play smart, you have to play well, uh, your decisions matter, and even getting hit once or twice when you have a really tough enemy, now all of a sudden you might not be able to parry the enemy. It's like, oh shit. Well, in comes uh, the at gear, another strategy, and uh, just being able to stagger lock enemies proactively was already better than parrying, even at early access launch. It was just made even better because of the stamina changes that also happened in Heart and Home. Being able to now just absolutely send in these basic attacks with the at gear. And with all sorts of weapons, honestly. It's just phenomenal. Uh, the stuff that they added in as well. Uh, they added the Crystal Battle Axe, which was amazing at the time. In certain scenarios where you could uh, isolate certain uh, enemies with Huntsman Bow from a falling camp. And then absolutely go wild with Sentinel Shack. Just aggroing everybody, pop bone mess. Get inside a building to force a chokehold. And then just uh, pop off with the cleave of that weapon. That was a fantastic time. The growths, oh my god, the growths are amazing. If you're having trouble with them, use Huntsman Bow and Fire Arrows. They are very weak to fire. A sneak attack with the Huntsman Bow is going to one-shot them with the DOT. And if you play right, it's not going to aggro the other ones, which means easy business, easy tar. The Dark Wood that the tar came out with, fantastic. Crystal Walls, one of my favorite build piece, decoration piece ever. I love Crystal Walls, that was Hearth and Hope edition. Big problem is, okay, why this doesn't hit special, Crystal Walls used to give what plus one comfort. They removed it. That precedent went on to be the rug removing comfort later on. Horrible, horrible, horrible precedent. Horrible decision. I mean, just the idea of progressing and getting more rested time and time again is a good idea. That's why they have it in there in the first place. Being able to have more of that, more progression, and still not too much because you don't have your, uh, uh, basically, like, I would think, like, an absurd amount of rest, like, over a day's rested would be, like, the, the covering every aspect because there are even some swamp crypts with dungeon RNG that could last over 30 minutes. Post Mistlands, with all of your rugs adding to comfort, you only got 30 minutes of comfort, which sounds weird for me to say only, but you look at the dungeon RNG and your biggest dungeons that you could find, uh, whether that be uh, Swamp Crypts, uh, Infested Mines, Frost Caves. You know, Frost Caves went deep, layer-wise. You could get Frost Caves uh, with Freak RNG that are like 10 plus layers deep, okay? That's gonna take like 30 minutes plus to clear. We don't. We never had over 30 minutes arrested. Same thing with Infested Mines. We never had over 30 minutes arrested. And of course, the Swamp Crypts. It's very rare. I've only had one instance where it was more than 30 minutes. Just one. But it has happened. And so these dungeon examples are only going to get more frequent as the design goes on. And yet we don't have the comfort for it right now. We don't have that wonderful progression for that right now. And they just went and took it away and it started here. Which is part of the reason why it's not going in all around amazing. Now, the bow changes I fully expected were going to happen. I knew that uh, battle axes were going to be buffed. I knew that bows were going to be nerfed. 
have a video up in my potato era where I fully predicted, I fully predict, I said straight up, battle axes are going to be buffed, bows are going to be nerfed. And two days later, literally two days later, Monty came out with her uh, little teaser, or fire, not a fireside chat, but it's just a teaser for Hearth and Home. And she said that uh, they were going to do just that. That they were going to nerf bows and buff battle axes. Now, nerfing bows mid-game progression-wise kind of sucked. And this is why they fixed it in uh, a later update, which I'll mention. But progression-wise, it was kind of a pain in the ass to level up bows after that. Uh, nowadays, I know, just snipe everything. But you're only going to get to a limited uh, amount unless you really get to grinding later. And because of that, I'm just... I gotta rank that lower, I gotta rank it lower because of the crystal situation and the precedent that that set. Uh, overall though, the new onions with the new food that that had for progression in the mountains was really good. Uh, everything that I also mentioned, just like going through, the bosses had been recently buffed in some weird summer patch before then. Uh, Locks riding and taming was cute. Taming was already in there, but the riding, which currently was pretty useless, and still is. Uh, that was cute. I liked that. It was a nice, you know, fun little shenanigans to do at the time. But the lack of actual mechanical use of Locke's writing, you know, I have to, again, drop it down from special to all around amazing. That's it for Hearth and Home. Let's move on now to the framework that's going to help people understand what's at the top of the top. Root update. Again, I'm working on a bang for your buck type of ranking here, but the root update literally just came out of nowhere. It was very small. It was Thanksgiving 2021, American Thanksgiving. Um, so it, this update just came out of nowhere. It dropped a new mini boss enemy in the swamp, which these types of scary mini boss enemies are your most iconic in Valheim. The abomination is fun as hell. I love the way that you can see it if you know what's going on. Uh, the drops from it are incredible. That root armor just changed the game going forward. Not only is bow progression fixed, but also the pierce resistance. So good in the swamp, so good in the uh, plains. Even good when you carry on further in its influence in the mistlands. Not only that, but being able to cover up that fire weakness with your good old fire res potions are that's just phenomenal that's phenomenal for adventuring in the plains and the mistlands so i love that uh it's just a fantastic fantastic addition i love how it's like a medium set and now we have precedent for like medium armor going forward oh that's phenomenal not only that but they went and later on buffed the abominations which is perfect because there's so many ways around them there are three different ways that you can cheese them in the swamps. Two of them are very similar. That being jumping on a structure. Whether that be a sunken crypt or a large ancient root. You can cheese them from up there. Or you can bring it over to a Sirling Geyser and burn it to death passively. Very good and deserving of being buffed. Now they also dropped, uh, in addition to roots, after that little buffing update uh, that they continued, or buffing patch, that uh, continued with the root update, there is a guck that it dropped. So, again, it went from just simple, like, oh, you know, we're just going to have this cool mob that has amazing implications with uh, the, the, the root and the root set that it drops. I'm forgetting to mention the poison res of the mask. Just phenomenal set overall. And then, it's like, oh, all of a sudden... Now it drops Guck, which is good for making the Draugr Fang, but also the green torches are now very easily to fuel, because before it was just the limited resource of the Guck trees, which is kind of a pain in the ass. But now we have A-bombs that we can get infinite Guck from, so long as they keep spawning. And that is just phenomenal. So it helps decoration-wise. In the Mistlands, they went and added Arbalest, which uh, takes root. So in the future, just... If they just wanted to keep people happy with time schedule, 
if they just kept on dropping an update that has like one new mob and like two new mechanical things and a few uh, aesthetic things overall, that would be phenomenal. Of course, the trophy is aesthetic, you know. The way that uh, the trophy could be used for the fishing bait uh, once Miss Land's dropped, phenomenal. You know, it doesn't have to start off being this decent influence with a bunch of different recipes. No, no, no. As long as you have one mob with a few drops, and th with those drops you can make a few things, but those few things have big impact on the game, you could crank out updates that are even better time schedule-wise and content-wise than Minecraft, the number one survival game I think that will be ever. So, having that there, this is huge potential for an amazing update schedule going forward that would keep everybody satisfied. And this is why the root update is always special to me. Always, always the best update that we've had. Special. Frost Caves. I love Frost Caves. Bit lacking, though. I love Frost Caves. I love them so much. But uh, the chests within them are terrible. They're horrible. All you had to do was add Wolf Pelt to the chests. And they would be fantastic. But the Fenris Armor, again... Huge impact. Fenris armor is so good. The speed that you have. As long as you're not getting hit, you are using X, Y, and Z to dominate the battlefield. Not only that, but the fire resistance on the Fenris Blessing. You can use that to actually take hits. You can shut down full enchantments. You can survive much better versus y'all. It's such an easy swap and you have all this movement. What's really amazing too is you can go full Fenris, pop Bone Mass, and all of a sudden you're super fast, have Fire Res, and all your Physical Res, and you can just tank X, Y, and Z hits. And, uh, you know, you still have food to cover you, potions to cover you. You do have armor that's going to stack with it, albeit minimal, compared to your heavy armor. But still, your speed combined with tools like Bow Frost Arrows, Froster to have proactive control, uh, At Gear to have proactive control, Stagger locking with Huntsman Bow Needle Arrows to have proactive control, so on and so forth. There is so much proactive control that you can have in this game, and reactive control. I mean, we're talking parry, that basically goes, you know, and only minimally worries about your armor because of the staggering mechanic that was added in Earth and Home. But you can just dominate, dominate the game with Fenris armor, maybe throw in a root harness here and there, and then Mist Lance changes things up further. But Fenris Armor at the time absolutely changed the game. And even with that as a reward, that was phenomenal. Now, Flesh Rippers, they're cute, but they are definitely just a mechanical letdown. They are overshadowed by so many different things. Uh, they're overshadowed, especially DPS-wise, by Sword at the time, even before it got Cleave and Mistlands. And Silver Sword already outshined Silver Knife DPS-wise pre-Mistlands. So... DPS-wise, all these things change. Oh, and I forgot to mention, like, Hearth and Home changed daggers and knives. So now they're not sneak attack kings, although they still kind of are. Uh, but they are less sneak attack oriented. And they're more regular DPS oriented. But that means they're just DPS-wise worse than Silver Sword. Which means they're worse than Black Metal Sword, and so on and so on. So, even considering Silver Knife... Silver Sword is just going to be DPS-wise better. At which point, the Sneak Attack... Why was that nerfed? Why couldn't we just have Sneak Attack be even better? And yeah, Flesh Rippers are even <laughs> worse than the Silver Sword. So we have a situation where Silver Sword, in a lot of circumstances, isn't even good at demolishing mobs like your Frostner, like your Black Metal Akir, or, or even Iron Akir. Iron Akir was stagger-locking... Uh, falling Berserkers and Locks. No joke. It can stagger. I got that on video. It's for years I've been doing it. It's absolutely dominant. You can destroy two star fallings with ease. You can do that with Frostner too. And Silver Sword is just kind of like damage on board. That was the same thing with the Flesh Rippers, but they decided to have like all sorts of weird other effects where it became a lot of people's pet weapon. A lot of people's cheap weapon of choice, too, if they were kind of half builders, half not, what I call semi-combatants in the co-op world, you know? 
people playing co-op always had a good uh, appreciation for the flesh rippers. And the problem is because people were heaping on praise for this weapon uh, without understanding the lack of mechanics, it never got buffed when it should have. And now in the Mistlands, it's just extremely, extremely lacking. And not only that, we don't have a Mistlands or future equivalent to bring into the Ashlands, which means these fist weapons are really just sad. So, bit lacking there. Again, the rewards uh, going beyond Fenris and Flesh Rippers. Good decorations, I suppose. Good ambiance, a great dungeon experience. I like the frozen lake, the rare, very rare thawed lake. No fish in it yet, again, so a lot of this stuff I gotta throw in bit lacking. Again, it could have really nice chest loot, but just does not. Just does not. Again, all it needed is wolf pelt that would compensate for the Fenris cost. Just does not. All the obsidian, silver necklaces, what have you. You can get that from the outside. But the precedent of being able to get, like, metal bars, not just metal ore, but metal bars from breakables, well done. I like that. So, still stays in B tier, bit lacking. Mistlands update. Bit lacking. I'm gonna put this above Frost Caves. Mistlands update's bit lacking. Some people are gonna put it in special, some people are gonna go, what's going on? And I think it's both of that. I think it's perfectly... Uh, B tier. It's perfectly bit lacking. And, well, I'm going to start with the positive. It is overall my favorite biome. And I think it is just an amazing adventure. There's somebody who put out a video critiquing Valheim not too long ago that talked about how you go through this process of discovery and then you craft and then you like domesticate the biome. You dominate it. And there's no, there's no way things can threaten you. You've dominated the biome. It's easy. It's over. And he said that that changes with Mistlands. Because you can't see. And no matter how far you get into dominating the Mistlands uh, on a technical level, you still can't see. And I would say that does not matter. Like, once you, once you have uh, dominated the Mistlands in terms of combat, uh, it doesn't matter that you, really, that you can't see here and there. Play carefully, know what's going on, uh, especially just don't just randomly dive into the mist with Feather Cape, or otherwise, you know, especially not without it, and you'll be okay, and you will dominate, and even if mobs catch you by surprise, it really shouldn't be a problem. When, if you're properly geared up, properly, uh, properly got your good strats, it really wouldn't, it's really not going to be an issue, so that's just a really interesting way to look at it. Uh, the mist being unclearable. I still don't like it. That's still a bit of a problem. You know? Just because I can deal with it doesn't mean it's an issue. Just like vertical combat. Just because the vertical hitboxes I can deal with and adapt to doesn't mean it's not an issue. Now, I would want everybody to adapt to it by now because we've had vertical combat issues in like every biome except for swamps. But still, it's still an issue. Now, a lot of people are going to say, again, it just has, it just, it just makes all of the same usual problems in Valheim worse. And that's ignoring all of the unique problems that Mistlands has and just not taking it upon oneself to adapt to the same old problems that Valheim has. So again, it's doing yourself a huge disservice and also doing Iron Gate a disservice and not giving them constructive criticism on the blatant stuff that they did mess up on. Let me just drink water real quick. I have a full document here with a bunch of Mistlands easy layups that they missed. So even though it has y'alls, which are fantastic. I love the Seekers. I love Infested Mines, my favorite biome now. The Queen is my favorite boss. I love the overall ambiance, the experience. The music is fantastic. The colors the lightning and the storms, I could gush about the adventure of the Mistlands for a long, long time. I still have a document full of stuff that are problems and easy layups. 
mechanically or what have you adventure wise let's get into it so I mentioned this already but the clearing mist thing there's no wisp light upgrades like you can't boost that in any way uh, there's also no wisp dragger circlet for some reason that would have been fantastic give yourself a different variety other than just equipping your accessory slot you know you can still have your belt your making yard but also clear the mist in a different way. That would be fantastic. A Wisp Lantern. We have Dvergur Lanterns. God, I love Dvergur Lanterns. Oh my god, the Black Marble and the... Oh, Mist Lens added so much, so much good stuff. But again, like... Being able to have... A Mist Lantern would be fantastic. I mean, look at Haldor's Lantern. That could have been it. Maybe we get the recipe from him. Nope. Nothing there. Uh, some starred mobs just don't give multiplied resources like every other mob in the game. Like Tixen, y'all. Don't give multiplied resources even though they're starred. That's obviously an issue. I mentioned this before, but there's no new fist weapon, but also no new battle axe weapon. Having lightning claws or lightning battle axe would be so good for the Mistlands. And we don't get it, and then they just start falling behind drastically. Mistlands update also buffed swords to give them cleave. One-handed swords. Not the Krom, the two-handed sword that they added in the mist lens. No, no, no. That giant thing, that doesn't have cleave. That doesn't have no multi-target penalty for some reason. But one-handed swords do. And now battle axes weren't buffed and they don't get a new version even though one-handed swords are now the slashing cleave option of choice. So they really did fist weapons, battle axes, and Krom dirty there. What is going on? Krom is resisted by all your seeker types. It's just pure physical. At least it's got Mistlands tier damage, unlike the Battle Axe and the Flesh Rippers. But still, it's got like a weird amount of end lag on its moves. And also, it just... There's no cleave on this giant sword. That's ridiculous. There is no friendly trading with the Dvergur. Surely they want some top quality food or meats or something. Or, I don't know. Any sort of cool craftsmanship that we can make, that we can trade for them for their Dvergur circlet so that these very friendly dwarves that are obviously kind to us we don't have to anger or kill in order to progress through the biome. Dvergur trading would be fantastic uh, even maybe learning the uh, spell or mage secondary abilities that they have we don't have mage secondary abilities but they do maybe we could learn it from them nope we can't do any of that we have to be mean to the dwarves Simply ludicrous. I mean, this just doesn't make me feel good. It doesn't make me immersed into the, so into the story or into the progression, into the world. It just does not feel good in any way whatsoever. It's just a massive, massive touch to the to the biome. This is not good. Tverger dock pieces are not available to us. What's up with that? Why were the Tverger docks teased? There's no new Mistlands boat. We don't get access to any of the dock pieces. There's nothing good to do at a potential dock. You can just break down a boat currently and throw it in the chest and bring it through a portal and do this and that. We don't have to manage and mess with docks, but we could have had incentive. We could have had all the spice in making a dock, especially with another thing that was teased that had no purpose, the Dverger hook build piece. Yes, at the docks as well, there are these hooks. Maybe we can do something with them, like age fish, make new new food dishes that, that cover for like uh, maybe full balanced HP, stamina, eider food. That doesn't exist. Maybe we have balanced uh, HP and eider, but with a little bit of stam. Maybe we have uh, eider stam with a little bit of HP. That doesn't exist. And we could have had access to that with uh, all of these new fish that we have that came with the Mistlands as well. We could have had all of this spice and yet we do have fish and bread which is a fantastic stamina food and a fantastic food and the food in the mistlands is just overall amazing with how renewable they are and how good quality it is it feels great but still like this hook piece again this is just something that was shown in the teaser that looked phenomenal that just, just has no purpose you break it and you get one chain wow fantastic what are we doing with this what, what could we have done with this? We could have done so much. I ever thought, like, maybe you could hang up a serpent on it and decorate. Like, something. Like, something cool. Maybe it would help uh, bringing uh, uh, ores on, on land. 
with a big hall so that it would be even more convenient quality of lifestyle. No, none of that. None of that. We didn't get any of that. It doesn't do anything. Uh, the large cart, which was also teased. It looks like it could attach to a lox. Maybe finally lox riding could have a proper mechanical use. Nope, that doesn't do anything. Can't attach it to lox. It just has sometimes bigger extractors in it. Doesn't do anything. Wow. Let's talk about infested mines now. The loot tables, even after they've been buffed, they're still not very good. What? The, okay, so they have some minor potions now. They got some sausages now. That's awful. That's awful. I know the infested mines are amazing. I know black cores is key for progression, and the amount of uh, strange good loot, including royal jelly, they can get in there is fantastic as it is. But we are just following this terrible precedent of having bad dungeon loot in the chests. Why? Why in the treasure chests of all things that are behind hidden doors that glow and then move and they make that sound and so satisfying and all oh, the cores light it up and there are these giant unique treasure chests and they don't have anything good in them. Really? Nothing good? Nothing good in them. Nothing. Potentially the Verger Tankard, which is an aesthetic thing. We can't even go back and trade them with the Dverger. If this stuff, if these mead and these sausages could be traded with the Dverger for stuff, then that would be good, but we can't even do that. In the infested mines also there are these uh, fake out hallways and like deeper areas that are just false. You can't go through them. Surely everybody's had the experience where you go over and you see the uh, the two pickaxes against this pitch black opening and you're like oh my god what's through there it's not a real passageway it's not a real entrance to anything there is no deeper dungeon area there is no other area in the infested mine which would be phenomenal i mean deeper dungeon zones have existed for a long long time i remember my favorite example of them being in dark cloud fantastic area that you had to use a certain unique resources uh, to act as a key to unlock them and then you went deeper and there were advanced enemies but also advanced loot what an opportunity that could have been and it just does not exist it's a fake out it's false speaking of fake outs there are these little uh, slits in the walls where you can potentially see mobs through they're not real they're not real you can see through them you can't shoot arrows or crossbow bolts through them at all. It's just additional wall, but with the actual like vision available. It's uh, let me snipe through them. Let me snipe through. We can already bonk through them with sledge. We can use ooze bombs through them just fine. We can use staff of embers AOE through them just fine. But we can't snipe through those little things. No, no, no. That's ridiculous. E obvious problem. Speaking of combat now, regular Seekers have this issue with, well, they have a problem with staggering. If you stagger them while they're just about to throw out a move, and this is the only mob in the game that'll do this, the animation will be canceled, but you'll get hit anyway. That's an issue. That's an issue. In the past, I've gone out and said, just flank the Seekers. All of their attacks are linear anyway. It is good to just flank them on the side or from the back anyway. So with good strategy, surely we'd be avoiding this regardless. No, because in the infested mine, sometimes you have no choice but to throw out a spin one with the ant gear. And guess what? In these cramped tight quarters, if you get a hell room, all of a sudden you've got a million different Seekers on you. I've found in one mega room up to like 16 Seekers that come after you. Guess what? You're not going to be able to flank all of them at once. And you're going to have to deal with them with staggering. You're going to get hit when you shouldn't be. Obvious problem. Easy bug. It's been reported for forever now and it's still not fixed. What an issue. Also, I should mention something with Frost Caves as well that is similar. Is a uh, same sort of thing happens to a small degree with uh, cultists throwing their fire out they throw out this cone aoe similar to greater shamans but if you stagger them with well iron gear let's say they will move 
when being staggered, and while they move for a split second, their fire cone will hit you. It'll change direction, even though they should be staggered, and hit you. Obvious problem, especially in have very hard mode. Very obvious issue. Just like, they, the devs know about it, but like, hasn't been fixed. We are post Mistlands. Hopefully almost to Ashlands. Hasn't been fixed. Also does not occur with Greater Shamans. It just, just doesn't happen with other cone AoE type enemies. So why does it happen with cultists? Who knows? Not a, like should be fixed. So yeah, seeker stagger hit bug is ridiculous. Uh, it's just ridiculous. What is it going on? Talking combat again. The queen safe room. Why does it? Why is that there? Why is there a queen safe room? That entranceway, which you can just camp out in and cheese the boss forever. Are we, why aren't we just actually incentivized to just go out and interact with the boss? Just do that. Just, it's, I've seen so many people's queen fights just ruined from what they potentially could offer because they are camping out on the bottom floor where it's all misty so that they can just go back to the safe room or they're just abusing the safe room. No, you want to climb. Use your feather cape. Climb up. Being able to drop down when the queen's on you when you're in trouble or when she's really close and get back all your stam or eider or what have you and then climb back up and counter and just having good positioning for the greater area of the infested citadel is a great deal of fun and can deal with the ads in a very simple way. It could deal with the queen burrowing here and there in an easy way. It can deal with your mage squishiness as the queen has chop and pickaxe and she can pop your bubble in one hit in a very easy way. Bubble gliding is key to retain momentum and keep yourself out of the way of harm's reach. Being able to have more space to glide down to is always good for any build. So being able to have that is key and yet most people, most casuals, are just incentivized to stay at the bottom in the safe room. Haha, <laughs> it's safe down here. It's a scary boss. Every boss is scary when you first fight it. You get used to it. You strategize. Not with the queen. Not with the queen. I don't know. A great deal of people are just not incentivized to strategize at all. When you can just cheese her just fine. No, it's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. The only boss with a safe room. Really? I understand that you could technically build yourself all of these different safe room ideas. Most people just don't go out of their way and do that for obvious reasons. It's just not, clearly not, how the game intends you fight. But with the Queen, it's literally built into the game and you can't change it. So a lot of people see that as, oh, this is an incentivized and, and clear good way of dealing with the boss. But it is just lacking in enjoyment. Fundamentally. Not as enjoyable, not as challenging, not as engaging. And the queen is my favorite boss otherwise. She's fantastic. There's so much strategy to be done. I love the queen. And yet, the queen safe room exists. Ballistas. Ha <laughs> ha Ballistas. Do I need to say any more? Ballistas are a joke in Valheim. They have been, even with the quality of life that was added into them, they are still fundamentally just not worth making. Why is that? Why is that? Why do they why do they go and make them like that? Well, they they can target you unless you make them specifically target one mob. It's like, no, this is base defense. I want it to be just base defense. I don't want to make safe passages. Putting a ballista up was already supposed to make the passage safer. Not have it be a give and take. This is a give. No take, only throw, you know? That's what the design should have been. That's what everybody's expected. That's what makes sense. But no, it's an automatic ballista and it fires on you. Haha, <laughs> hee hee moment. Oh, well, what a goofball situation. I'm just never gonna make one then. Cool, great. So it's there, it's really cool, and it just doesn't function properly. Again, if you have a base defense, and you have to make an actually safe way in, 
an actually secure way in for yourself, that's not really base defense. That is conditional base defense. Every other base defense is not conditional. Every other base defense. Yes, you can run into spiked walls. Spiked walls doesn't actively track you and shoot at you. And guess what? Raids in the future, raids now, are not just going to have one mob, which you can put a trophy on. They're going to have a bunch of different mobs. I have seen somebody go out, build a very specific area with safe room, safe passage for ballistas and say, he said, look, ballistas work. Here's how you can make it work. Conceptually broken, even by default. In any way, there was the Yawl Raid. Guess what? The ticks still got around the ballista that was situated even in the safe hallway. It got around. So moms in the future, in, in at potential Ashlands raids, they're going to get around too. They're going to get through too. Your safe area, by definition, if it's not defended by ballistas, is less fortified than it could be. Mobs are probably going to get through. We're just fucking around in, in La La Land with our defenses here. This is ridiculous. We have defenses. We want around our entrances because the entrances are already weak. Because they are entrances. <sighs> we want bonus defense around our entrances. Not less defense. Extra defense. And we have to have less defense now. Because of how shit the ballistas are. This is ass backwards design. Horrible. Jotunbane. Let's talk about Jotunbane now. That's a terrible weapon. Poison doesn't stack additively. It replaces. The axe is still slower than the sword. It doesn't have cleave. Investing in axes for two-handed axes isn't as good anymore. Because we don't have a Ashlands two-handed axe. Or, well, we might be getting one of those. But we don't have any Mistlands two-handed axe in the Mistlands. We don't have any of that. What we have is this partially poisonous thing that's just not very good. Just use the Mistwalker. Just use the Mistwalker. I'm telling you right now. The Yoten Bane, it's not cheap. You still have to use your Eider. You still have to use everything. Not good. You know, cost iron and all that. And for poison damage, poison damage on an axe, you still attack relatively quickly, even though it's slower than sword. So you're just going to be resetting your potential DUT, and you have less damage over time than the Black Metal Axe. It is a downgrade. It costs more stamina to use, and you get less DPS. Less staggering than your Black Metal Axe. You're not as functional in terms of damage as your Mistwalker is. And you certainly don't have the control and frost damage that the Mistwalker does. Oh, it's so bad. It's so bad. What is the purpose of that going to be? What purpose does it have? Are we going to, after one tier of axe, have to make the Jotunbane for Ashlands wood? Really? What purpose does that have? What an absolute waste of Matt Snyder. Oh god, the Jotunbane. Holy shit, how terrible. Why is that again? Dvergar Lanterns, you just can't place them in an item stance. You can't put them on tables or on your windowsills like the Dverger have in their own halls. We can't do that. Why? Uh -huh, I, don't, I don't know. The Dverger Lanterns are already my favorite decorational piece, even with the instance pieces that we have now. But being able to slap them on an item stand seems like it makes the most sense as well. We can't do that. Why? Mm -hmm. Who knows? Who the hell knows? You know... I have a lantern on my table, literally right in front of my face. That's cool. Can't do that in Valheim. Why? <laughs> you know? Who fuck knows? 
Um, let's talk about obvious classic issues still present in the Mistlands. This is the stuff that people are uh, talking about usually when they say like, oh, the Mistlands exacerbated the issues that were already present in Valheim. Uh, one of them is just from the Jotunbane thing that I mentioned. The poison damage still not stacking hit to hit. Oh, oh why? Just adjust the poison damage if it's going to stack hit to hit. Just make the poison damage less overall on the enemy side, and we'll be fine with it. It'll be fine. You've made radical adjustments to things in the past with, like, Hearth and Home. We can manage with this. And to have it be more useful for us in combat would be great. Vertical hitbox jank still exists, still plenty. Spear quality of life is still missing, even though we have the most vertical semi-aquatic thing for our, our spear tosses to get uh, lost in. Spear quality of life is still missing, even with spear hitbox being still janky. It's, why don't we have spear quality of life yet? Make the speedrunners really happy, you know, come on. Um, heavy armor chest and legging pieces are still missing good benefits. Carapace armor... Uh, even the heavy armor users were disappointed in the carapace armor. Why does this normal ass armor y use either? This magical, magical material. It doesn't have any secondary benefits. I don't need like a bunch of different things like what the medium or light armors have. Just give it like one thing. Guess what? The heavy wolf chest has a secondary benefit in frost res. I know it's out qual it's it's outclassed it's uh, overlapping with like uh, frost res cape and the beauty of the feather cape and all of that but still the precedent was set and it wasn't followed there was precedent and we didn't follow it going on from the the porcupine oh my god they did the porcupine so dirty the porcupine is good against uh, killing golems you know something that was uh, done in the mountains that you can do well with the iron mace regardless that's what it's the best at. And people can say, oh, well, you know, it's a little bit good at this, it's a little bit good at that. It's a kind of an all-rounder weapon I can bring everywhere. You know, you know, we have a full hotbar that we can fill with weapons that dominate in a variety of different damage types. This porcupine thing is just not mechanically incentivized. And yet, aesthetically, it sure looks like it. It sure has the vibe and the, the aura. The, the metaphorical, metaphysical aura. I don't blame anybody for thinking that this would be a legitimately good option moving forward in the plains, in the mistlands. And yet it is fundamentally worse than Frostner. It is worse than black metal at gear. It's worse than your iron at gear. In the plains and mistlands. The bronze at gear performs better than seekers because it can stagger lock them from the mid range, mid close range. Bronze at gear. Bronze at gear. The porcupine should have had something. And you know, I suggested a wind damage in a video a while back. It's like, oh, well, you modify certain things, and now you have a wind element that you can have it be instead of a pierce. And now we're cooking with gas because wind doesn't necessarily have to be resisted. It could also be made as, as a weakness to seekers. But we didn't get that. We didn't get that. We didn't get anything for the porcupine. I thought the Mistlands was going to be where the porcupine finally shined. No. It just looks good on your wall. Yeah. You look stylish going back to the mountains for crystal. Yeah. You're stylish. You know. Pair it with the carapace shield. Enjoy that teal glow. That's kind of my favorite color anyway. I like it. I like it. I love it. I love the look of it. It's so aesthetic. It's satisfying. It's beautiful. I used to be a Froster main. I used to have all of those club levels. I wanted the Porcupine to be good for so long, and it's not. And it probably never will be. Kind of depressing. Anyway, moving on. Uh, from the Mistlands, also, we have uh, Hildur's Quest. Hildur's Request is also, you know, it's going to see. The world modifiers, if I could separate the world modifiers and all of that. Oh, and 
Hilda's Quest, I think, is also where the JSMR's quality of life stuff, so ignore this Black Forest. Is. Let's move that up, then. Just considering. But Hilda's Quest also had a lot of uh, mist layups. <laughs> Not as much as the mist lands, but... I mean, the world modifiers are hard carrying this update. The actual quest for Hilda's Quest, uh, it is optional content, but uh, the mechanical rewards are very limiting. When you have a big co-op or community server type situation, actually having those build stamina uh, efficiency clothing is going to be pretty damn solid. That's going to be really good. But in a solo run, which Valheim, Iron Gate says Valheim is designed for playing solo. So I'm going to judge it based off of that. Even though I'm going to give it bonus points for actually still working and having a benefit in co-op. It still has to be judged on the solo experience. The, the, the Hilders clothes, the Hilders rewards are not mechanically incentivized at all. It might as well just be sealed tower because there are eggs there. Getting early eggs is really cool, and you get them. You can get them really early, and now you have efficient food, which is even better in co-op because now you can just have your hyper efficient food. And it's obviously having all of these chickens is going to be fantastic because you can get a big farm going before Mist Lands, and then boom! As soon as you go into Mist Lands, get some black marble, and you are cooking quite literally. You have all of your uh, honey glazed chicken. You have more importantly all of your mushroom omelets. Amazing, amazing, amazing. And that's fantastic. Sealed Tower is a lot of fun. All these mini dungeons are great fun. The Sealed Tower, very specially so. I love the Sealed Tower. Uh, again, getting the eggs from them. Mm -mm -mm. Great reward. Not as good as it could have been. All of these mini bosses could have also dropped unique mats, which could have been unlocking really cool recipes for weapons that are missing in certain tiers. We could have had amazing opportunity from Hildur to get a Sather table, which would be an early game equivalent to the Galder table. Maybe we get early magic. Maybe we get an early Arbalest, uh, or an, or an early crossbow recipe from her. Yes, these things are normally advanced tech, but guess what? We have a member of a race who uses that advanced tech, who has traveled all of this way as a vendor, as a merchant, and who is in need of somebody to go questing for her. We have room from not only Hildur, but from the mini bosses themselves to get cool mats and get cool mechanically incentivized rewards so that we can go out and absolutely change the game. It doesn't take much, like we've shown with the root update, it doesn't take much mechanically to absolutely have huge game-changing effects that brings so much fun and amazing time into the game. And we just did not have that with Hildur's Quest. And the devs' reason for this is ass backwards again. They said several times, because this is optional content, that we're not going to have mechanically incentivized rewards because it's optional. Excuse me, what? No. It is optional content, therefore, you have to incentivize it with mechanical rewards. That is, I mean, their reason behind that is fundamentally as backwards. Fundamentally. Backwards. Horrible, horrible, horrible thinking. But we have JSMR's quality of life and world modifiers, which is going to add so much to the game already, and already has added to the overall experience of Valheim to such an immense degree that going forward it is going to maintain its status as one of the top quality survival games in the world. So I can't fault it too much. The world modifiers do carry that update so hard. So so hard. If it was just world modifiers it would be in special. Let's be real. It would be in it's truly it would be a truly special update. But hey, this is a long video as it is. Do let me know if I missed something strange. Did I miss something strange? Do tell me. Let me know what you think. Uh, I, I, I do want to make this tier list video now because also, of course, you know, there's going to be so much to talk about with the Ashlands. We've got a million teasers for that. Yes, it's taking a long time. 
It has potential to be everybody's favorite biome. It has potential to be beyond special in ranking. It also has potential with all of its unique quirks and all of its add-ons to be what's going on tier. And I don't want that at all. I want it to be truly special and beyond. And I hope you do too, and I hope you can understand at a deeper level now what I mean and what Valheim could do going forward. I'm talking, and I've done this in a video by itself before, little root-like updates in between all of your giant biome updates. That would be fantastic, and I think everybody would be pleased and would be actually touting it as above Minecraft update schedule. I would love that. I think the community would love that. I think Iron Gate would appreciate the praise that they would get from that and the engagement that the community would have going forward. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys some other time. Bye!